Welcome back to part two of the P38 podcast. I have a couple quick announcements I want to go over before we get started. First off, a new t-shirt is going to the store as soon as this video goes live. You can see it's the Mojito t-shirt in front of you. It'll be $14 the first 24 hours, and it goes up to $20. We'll be holding a question and answer podcast for the next one. So if you have any questions you'd like to ask myself, Kobe, uh, maybe we'll get more evil involved, go ahead and ask those in the comments below. And lastly, we will be doing a holiday event on the Sunday after Christmas. You can find the date and time in the Steam Group events, and we'll be giving away one of those Mojito t-shirts then. So we left off talking a little bit about the earlier P-38s. And we kind of just got to Europe where the P-38 started doing a lot of bomber escort missions and a little bit about the Pacific. In this one, we're going to expand more about the Pacific and more about the three later models. Primarily just the J and L. The K is kind of a, just a footnote. But there's some things I want to go back and cover that we need to expand on the first one. In early 1944, Tony Levere was ordered to go to Europe. And this was the Lockheed test pilot. He's very, I guess you call him, he's somewhat famous, I guess, right? I guess yeah, he was the community. first guy that flew the P-80. He was he was a lot of stuff. He was Kelly Johnson's right-hand man when it came to that stuff. The reason why he was ordered to go to Europe was because the P-38 was having a bad rap. Some of that was because the plane had some issues. Other parts were because pilots were not trained properly how to fly the P-38. So he was kind of on a goodwill mission to, uh, to help these pilots transition to the P-38. The other problem, though, the P-38 really had was, and this is where most of the bad rep came from, it was designed in, you know, South Cali and warm temperatures, what served in the Pacific, it was in the Mediterranean, right? And then now it's flying high, you know, high altitude missions and bomber escort runs in Northern Europe where it's freezing cold. And there's a lot of cases where pilots had frostbite or just freezing, you know, just cold, you know, frostbite on their toes and hands because the aircraft didn't have proper heating. That's quite miserable, and you can see where a pilot would hate the aircraft if they were uh, in fear of losing their toes or fingers. The aircraft also had many problems with maintenance, as we covered. It was prone to engine failures, turbocharger failures, it had compressibility issues like we talked about. Then the aircraft was unable to perform a split S, which is a very basic maneuver. The new models, the J and L, fixed about 99% of these issues. These were completely different birds. A lot of things were kind of fixed and moved on, and... And you can't look at the two, you know, everything before and everything after. It's like the moment where everything changes, you know. And the maintenance got better and parts became more available and more P-38s came available and so on. So now the E, F, and J, and H are very difficult to tell the difference between the outside. And the J and L are kind of out, are kind of hard to tell as well. Some of the later L's you can tell because they have, you know, where you have the rear-facing um, warning radar on the back right fin. And then the landing light is in the wing. What else is there? The gun cameras on the pylon. There's little things you can see, but some of the late J's have those features as well. Yeah, the J from the Dash 25 on is basically an L model. Same thing. But the J's and the L's made up a majority of the P-38 production. There were basically 9,923 P-38s made. 7,000 of them were of these two models. Some of the purists, though, liked the earlier P-38s because of the very clean lines. You can usually tell a J and you can easily tell a J and an L because it has what they call either beard or a chin. You have those big air intakes underneath the engines. And so some of those clean lines were run by the addition of those coolers. But they were, that's a change that had to happen. They were necessary. On the older P-38s, there was a very complex system that was used for cooling. Basically kind of in the leading edge of the wing. And then further back, I'm, I don't quite understand this myself. I don't think you maybe understand better than I do, Kobe. Yeah, it's called an intercooler, what you're talking about. When you compress air, it gets hotter, just by nature. So when the turbo superchargers compress the air, it gets hotter. Well, hot en engines don't like hot air. They like cool air because you get more bang for the buck with, with gasoline out of it. So they run the compressed air through this thing called an intercooler, which is basically kind of like a radiator for air, and it cools it down. Uh, the problem is that in the early ones, and the E and the F and the G and all that stuff like that, the intercoolers were buried in the leaning edge of the wing. They weren't very, very big. So because of that, the airplane would not make rated horsepower because it, it couldn't get the air cool enough. So what they did finally with the J is they put a different type of intercooler in the airplane, moved it from the, moved it from the leaning edge of the wing down to below the engine, 
They also put a bigger oil cooler on it too to help cool down the engine as well. So then the airplanes could finally make rated horsepower. There was a restriction on the uh, inches of manifold pressure that a pilot could pull because they would overheat the engines because they couldn't get enough cool air into the engines to begin with. So that was finally solved with, with the J. Now besides making a simpler system and freeing up that space in the leading edge of the wing, it was also a safety issue. The earlier P-38s had this little problem where the complex cooling system led to basically what you would call an explosive backfire. Sometimes these would actually warp the wing, it would damage parts of the engine, or in some cases it would actually set the engine on fire. So this is a system that pilots are very happy to have be gone. So P-38J and L had this new system, and you have this new free space in the leading edge of the wing since there's no intercoolers there. And basically I believe some of the middle to later model J's had these 110 gallon fuel tanks put in there in the leading edge of the wings, and then I believe 60, all the yeah, L's did. Or that's 65, correct. Yeah, 65 and 60, 62 gallons a side, so 122 gallons total. Yep. Uh, about half the airplanes were equipped with the with leading edge tanks. It just kind of kind of varies. Um, there is no rhyme or reason to what airplanes got it. They just some some got them, some didn't. I think it just kind of depended on what was available at the time that they were built. It's also important that the J and L have the same engines, but the L has some modifications and things that were adjusted for efficiency that made the aircraft gain a little bit more horsepower and better performance and so on. But it's the same, they're basically the same Warbirds. It's just the L is an improved, refined version of the J. Of the J, that's correct. And, and the late model J from the, from the Dash 25 on, like I said earlier, is basically an L. It's, it's the exact same airplane. It's the exact same airplane. There's very little difference between it. The first 220 J models built though have a curved windshield from 221 and on. They moved to a flat bulletproof windshield which is something, like I said, just little footnotes, you know, things they changed. Um, this new windshield, though, improved visibility, reduced the reflection, and, of course, added more protection to the pilot. Yeah, um, you can see it. If you look in War Thunder, you can see in the G and the E models, you can see the curved plexiglass windshield with the armored glass behind it inside the airplane. What they did is they changed it to where it was a three-piece windshield with the glass outside the airplane where the plexiglass was. Greatly improved a bit and greatly improved visibility looking straight ahead. The issue about frostbite and basically almost nearly freezing to death was fixed by adding more heaters. There was also a foot warmer added and they also added the, what's it called, hot air defrosters, which could be, it's basically a, I don't know, we call it some type of like heating lamp, I guess, that could be used to defrost the windshield, but also used to warm your hands. You also put in better gun heaters too. And then the controls were also simplified to make more room in the cockpit, trying to get rid of some of those switches and stuff. Earlier P-38s had electrical nightmares. The J eliminated all fuses and, and exchanged them for breakers, so they could actually be reset during flight. That was another big safety thing. Yep. And then dive recovery flaps were added to all J-25 and on builds. It's very important to note, though, that the L had an aileron boost system which made the plane easier to fly and greatly increased the roll rate. Late model J's did as well. They had hy they had hydraulic um, boosters for the ailerons that uh, was fed off of pressure from the from the yoke. So it it's connected with with cables originally, but when you got to a certain point, the hydraulic booster kicked in. Basically, it was like having a second set of hands on on the control stick on the yoke. And that's why in the game you see the L roll so much better than the J, especially at higher speeds. And that was a real difference with the, with the later J's and L's, like you mentioned. Uh, 951 recon models were built from the J and L. I also want to add that rocket tubes were rushed to the field for the J model. Almost a thousand of them were produced, and pilots hated them. They created drag, and they were unreliable. You can see those in the game with Zuka tubes. The L got what's called the Xmas tree launcher. Held held ten ten rockets, five on each side. Basically, what it is 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 basically a T with. Uh, Looks like an upside down Christmas tree. You just hang the rockets on here to fire off there instead of those big giant bazooka rockets. And like I mentioned, the L had the rear facing radar. You want to talk yeah, about Yeah, it's called the AN APS 13. It's basically a really low powered radar system. The D Model 51, some of the later D Model 51s had it. I think actually the P 47 had it as well. And I know in the, uh, the N model had it. Um, we had a problem with the Germans sneaking up on us and basically what it is is it's two antennas a broadcast antenna and a receiver antenna 
it would broadcast a signal, and if that signal was, was broken, the receiving antenna would, would pick that up. It would either, depending on the airplane, light up a light or, or light off a buzzer, and then you knew that someone, someone was behind you. It was totally passive. There was nothing you could do about it. It was just on or off. It wasn't like a, like a traditional radar system where you got vectors and you got distance and speed and everything else like that. It was just either on or off. So I real quickly want to mention the P-38K. There was one, it was basically a like pre-production model. It was a K that I believe was built from a P-38E. Yep. And they basically did some testing. They were trying to get better high altitude performance. It had some adjustments and things they tested. And then basically those, they decided to skip the K model and just introduce the K they mixed the J and the K together to make the L. They just took the what they learned about the K and put it into production line with the L. So the K, it's not that big a deal. You know what I mean? It, it, K is non-existent. It really yeah, is. Yeah, it's, it's just a it, test it, aircraft. It's just a footnote. Yeah. Um, but it's important to notice that's why K was kind of skipped because they went with the L. Now, there's two other lightnings I want to mention, which are pretty cool machines. There's the Droop Snoot, <laughs> which was a film modification. They basically replaced the nose of the aircraft that had all the guns in it with a bomber nose. Um, a second crewman would lay down the nose, and he had no way of bailing if something happened. He had a Norton bomb sight, and that lead P-38 would fly with other P-38s behind it, and they would find the target, and they would drop all their bombs together. Yeah, it was actually a pretty, pretty good idea. They, uh, it was done um, by Lockheed Northern Ireland in, um, I forgot where, what city, it might have been in Belfast or something like that, but it was, a, it was originally a, an idea that a guy came up with, and he created a wooden mock-up and basically made a mock-up out of plywood. They flew it around for a little while and realized that it, it, it would work. Uh, they learned, learned this from the Mosquito Pathfinders. Uh, so they took out all the guns, they made a, plexigui- a plexiglass mold over the wooden nose, stuck it on the airplane, and basically it became a Pathfinder airplane. Uh, it, it went in before bombers, it also went in before P-47s and other P-38s. Um, they also used it for forward weather observation. Oftentimes, they would fly along before the raid came in with a weather observer on board to get the final weather details. It had a Norton bomb site installed. He would actually um, do the other airplanes to drop their bombs so that the, the bombing was much more accurate than if everyone just did it themselves. Uh, there was also another version called the Pathfinder that took the BTO radar, bombing through overcast radar, and put it in the nose along with it with the bombardier who was trained to operate the radar. It's like um, ground mapping radar though. It looked at what was on the ground and yes, that's how they navigated. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's they could actually pick out the target by the shape of the of, of the radar return. Uh, we had a problem in Europe later in the war with overcast skies and uh, it was installed on, on the B twenty nine as well. And so they started radar bombing with it with it as well. Now you're asking why are they bombing with P thirty eights a P-38, the J and the L could hold up to 4,000 pounds of bombs, which that that's that's a lot of bombs. You know, that's two guys or one guy dropping bombs that you normally send, let's say, a B-17 to hit or B-24 or a Lancaster. It's much easier. You know what I mean? You still had the same kind of effect with a much cheaper price with an aircraft you already have. And it was, I guess you call it effective for the most part. Very effective. Um, there are some cases, though, where there's some documentation that shows that P-38s in Pacific would go up to 5,200 pounds of bombs on takeoff and dropped. I guess that'd be 4,000 under the fuselage, and they fit the others underneath the wings, like 300 pounders on the wings or something. But the aircraft had a massive bomb load capability for for a single-engine fighter. I also want to mention real quick when I was doing some research about the droop snoots is that when the Pathfinder came in, there was a bunch of basically free droop snoots sitting around. They, they took those off, and they replaced it with the Pathfinder nose. So the mechanics like to fix up the droop snoot. They made it more comfortable, I guess they call it lavish, uh, kind of interior. And then they would fly, basically fly, use that as their own like executive transport, I guess, to go around. Um, so pilots could fly with somebody if they want to go somewhere for a spare P-38. There's one confirmed conversion from, from the Lockheed Center in Northern Ireland that came out as a VIP airplane from the get-go. There were others converted afterwards as well. Real quickly, I actually found my notes right here about the P-38K. I wrote a few things down I want to mention. Uh, P-38K had a modified Allison engine. They put on a paddle prop on there. It had, like I said, high altitude performance. Had poor reliability. I guess you can kind of compare it to the P-47M. High performance, low reliability. Um, it was abandoned for the L. Like I said, all that stuff was put into the... Um, I'm sorry, you know, the P-38K was abandoned for the L, and all that stuff went into the L. That's what I was trying to say. The P-38M was a night fighter. 
which were, com were which were L's converted to two seaters, and those only saw, I believe, service in the Pacific. Uh, I think they were in Europe. I don't know if they were in Europe too. I honestly don't know. They they weren't. They were okay. It was the best thing that we had. It was more of a stopgap measure before the sixty one became you know really available in numbers. So, real quick story. The problem in the Pacific, why we needed so many night fighters, was the Japanese knew they didn't have really a chance of, with Betty's and Key 21s or whatever to bomb bases during the day. The air coverage was too strong. And before the P-61, there was nothing really that we had that could stop Betty's flying over the middle of the night and bombing things. And you can read some cases of like P-38s working with ground crews. They, you know, they'll have to scatter spotlights and the P-38s would try and see the Betty's and then try to shoot them down. That's how primitive it was. Like they were shining spotlights and the P-38s would try and catch Betty's in the middle of the night. And that's why the night fighter was needed to stop the nighttime raids from the Japanese bombers. And let's talk about the Pacific a bit, and then we're going to talk about some aces and some important notes. Um, P-38s arrived in November of 1942 to Pacific Theater. They were emergency reinforcements for Guadalcanal. I also want to note that P-400s that were basically exchanged back from the British were there. And I think there was P-39s, maybe a few of those there as well. And those listed aircraft do not have very good high altitude capabilities. Um, at this point, Guadalcanal was being protected by Wildcats, and I think they had a few other things there, but mostly Wildcats. I think they were Marine Wildcats, actually. Anyway, they flew in, they kind of relieved the Navy and Marines, um, they kind of worked together for a while, and then one morning the P-38 pilots woke up and all of the Marine Wildcats were gone. And what they later found out was that the Navy did not like telling the Army anything about their ship movements or where they're going because they wanted to protect the location of their carriers and battleships. And there's one case where one of the P-38 pilots was like, hey, I saw a battleship over here. And the Navy officer's like, no, there's no battleship. And he goes, I'm pretty sure it was a battleship. It was U.S. too. And he goes, no, you never saw anything. There's no ship like a Jedi mind trip. You did see nothing. <laughs> this is not the ship you're looking for. Um, so then the kind of the American pilots are kind of surprised. But basically, the formation that they used for combat this time, because they didn't have enough of anything, P-38s weren't available enough, and like like we said, we took the P-400s back. We had P-39s, P-40s showed up. Is kind of like the, the P-40s, the P-400s, P-39s, everything, kind of flew middle altitude, while the P-38s flew top cover, and they just kind of sandwiched the zeros in one big furball, and it worked. Very, very effectively. The first official record of an interception flight by P-38s on Japanese airplanes was on December 27, 1942. It took a while for the P-38 to get into action due to parts and maintenance and just learning the theater and a bunch of other things. But on that day, 12 Lightnings dove on a formation of 20 or so Japanese fighters and 7 bombers. They lost one P-38 and 11 casualties from the Japanese. Another important mission was January 6, 1943. A bunch of P-40s and P-38s attacked Japanese landing crafts or troop ships uh, p-38 shot down 13 the p-40 shot down 20 aircraft and that's the first mission that richard bong is noted on and he killed three aircraft that day so 13 kills to p-38 three were richard bong that was to believe the first time his first kills were that day p-38 versus zeros is probably important to note for war thunder they told all their pilots that you never you have every advantage over the zero except for turning and steep climbing so pilots are told you come in fast, you keep your speed above 215 pH, you do not turn, you do not scissor, you do not zim climb. You just stay in a straight line, attack, straight line, you know, gradually climb, and so on. And I also want to mention real quickly, the first confirmed kill of a P-38 on A-0 was on November 26th, when Lieutenant Robert Ferrat, Ferrat went on a raid to New Guinea and tried to bomb an airfield where a zero was taking off. The bomb, the 500 pound bomb missed the runway, went to the ocean and a plume of water shot straight up and killed a zero that was taking off. Basically sucked it into the ocean and gone forever. Since there were several eyewitnesses, this is a confirmed kill and he actually got an air kill for this. As new P-38s entered the theater, the advantages that the P-38 had, the speed and everything else kind of grew and grew and grew. As, a, as time passed, the aircraft became you know, parts were more available, aircrafts were more available, like we mentioned, and the P-38 kind of ran away um, with the show when it versed the Zeros. Even the Q-61s, you got to realize, we always say, like, it was this versus the Zero. It was more actually P-38s versus Key-44s, what, Key-61s. Those were the majority of the things they shot down, and a poor Key-61 and a Key-44 and a Key-43s don't really have a chance against a P-38. Yeah, I think they're more probably 
KF-43s more than anything else. Really, I mean, I think most of Richard Bong's uh, kills were were Oscars, which is which yeah, 43s. And and those poor things just didn't have a chance, really. I mean, unless you, you know, gave it to them, you you stole the show. All right, so we're gonna talk about a few very important people. First one is Charles Lindbergh. It's a very famous. You want to real quickly go over Charles Lindbergh life for anybody who doesn't know him for some reason. Oh, uh, you know, Charles Lindbergh is the first person to fly across the Atlantic uh, solo. Did it in 1927, July 1927, I think. Um, he was a pretty good, he was actually a very good pilot. He was just a small Minnesota guy. He's from a really sh- shitty town in Minnesota. Never did really anything until he flew across the Atlantic. Um, the war, he was a consultant for a United Aircraft Company, which is the company that uh, now owns Pratt & Whitney. And just recently sold off the Korsky helicopter. Um, became a consultant. And he did a couple things. First off, the Marines were having trouble with the F4U Corsair getting the range out of them. So he flew down to the Pacific and taught the Marines how to basically fly their airplane correctly and get more range out of the airplane. Did the same thing with the P-38s. Um, they, he was able to get, what did you say, it was two hours more? I think it was like two hours or 600 miles more. Ridiculous. Andy, I think he surpassed that, maybe a little bit more than 600 or something. Like, it was insane. Probably. He got, like, two hours yeah. more of flight, which is huge. Um, when you're flying over the ocean and you need range, every every mile you could get on that thing was important for the ocean you're trying to cross. And it could potentially save your life, because if you have no fuel, you're just screwed out there. There's nowhere to sit down. And keep in mind, Charles Lindbergh was never in the military officially. He was a civilian contractor has one confirmed kill in the p-38 and probably a lot more because he flew with a lot of guys on actual missions instead of just flying the airplane he actually went out and and did and did some japanese hunting he basically taught himself how to fly p-38 and then how to do things better control this control that and they went along with the pilots on basically easy missions learning what they do and how to basically make it more effective and his P-38 was loaded, and a Zero dropped in front of him. He blew that away. And like I said, he went on actual missions with the guys um, like anybody else. He is only credited officially with shooting down a little scout plane, little piece of junk scout plane, but he actually shot down a lot more than that. The next P-38 pilot, which we absolutely have to talk about, is Richard Bong. He is the highest US ace of any theater. That's correct. Yeah, he had 40, 40 confirmed kills, all in the P-38. Um, our second... Runner-up was also a P-38 pilot. He had 38 kills. We're going to talk about him in a minute. Richard Bong, it's important to note he was a Medal of Honor winner. Uh, he first received attention. This guy was always kind of a rock star from the beginning. He first received attention by looping around the Golden State Bridge and then flying down downtown uh, San Francisco on Market Street, waving at people in buildings that were working. Uh, so Nuts. So that got, you know, the general's attention, and the general was somebody who looped, uh, I believe, a bridge in New York, so he was like, oh, that guy's like me. And he was handpicked, Wong was handpicked to be one of the first 50 P-38 pilots to the Pacific. So he quickly became flight leader, you know, he flew 146 missions, 365 hours of combat time, 28 kills, and dogfighting. And then, of course, you have all these other numbers like transports, recon planes, whatever else he took down. Um... He was sent home at one point for eight months, and then I believe he went home, what did you say, for Christmas or something at one point? Yeah, he went home in, uh, I think it was December and January of 44, or December 44, January 45, uh, as a gift, kind of. He, he, he got a month off and was, and was able to go home. Um, before that, he was on a um, he was on a war bond drive, and the airplane that he used for the war bond drive was the one that's named Marge, which is... The, kind of the famous picture of the other one with his wife on there, though he didn't really fly that airplane a lot in combat. It was his airplane, but he, he, he didn't really fly it a lot. He flew another airplane, mostly, uh, as far as the Jays go. He flew one called Downbeat, which is the one that he got most of his kills in. He also started, he also, well, he started out flying F models as well, but those weren't named. Whenever you reached the highest ace mark, you were pulled from combat because they wanted to protect you and sell war bonds. Well, they pulled Bong out, he went back to the States, and then he somehow he somehow was able to convince them to put him in a gunnery instructor position as a non-combatant, and he shot down more, he shot down 12 more airplanes as a non-combatant. When he hit 40, the Pentagon feared that they were going to eventually lose him, so they basically shipped him back home 
and somewhere of ni 1945. Yeah, he kind of screwed up. Uh, they, they, he was a test pilot for Lockheed in the P-80 program. Um, there was a new fuel pump that they were trying out, and he something happened. What they think happened is that he didn't, he didn't turn on the fuel pump, and basically the airplane ran out of fuel, even though it had tons of fuel on board, and he crashed, and the fire is what kind of done him in. The plane exploded. A crash in the it was fire. A fire yeah, bomb. the plane basically exploded. He didn't feel a thing. The plane was just gone, vaporized. So that was the end of Richard Bong. They tried to save him, and, and sadly, on the basically the day the war was going to end, you know, August 6, 1945, yeah. he died. That's that's his yep. life for you, right? <laughs> so there's, there's evidence that um, he actually forgot to turn on the fuel pump because a few days earlier, he was on another sim similar test flight, had a, had a flame out, and mentioned in his after action report that he forgot to turn on the new fuel pump. So they think the same thing happened again, except this time he went into the ground and crashed and died. Now the other ace we're going to talk about is a little bit less known gentleman named Thomas McGuire or Tommy McGuire. He was another Medal of Honor winner. He had 38 air kills. And among the servicemen he flew with, he was considered the better pilot and basically the bigger celebrity among the other Army pilots. This guy was basically famous for his skill. Um, he pulled maneuvers that no other P-38 pilots would. He flew fearless, and he, he, he flew head-on into action. This guy was... And he also flew straight into the ground, Boy, too. Boy, we're going to get to that. He flew with Charles Lindbergh a lot. Actually, Charles Charles Lindbergh mentioned mentioned that, that he, was one of the, he was one of the best guys that he liked to fly with a lot of times. Now, there's a few times that Richard Bong and Tommy McGuire did hook up and fly together. It wasn't. It was never really planned. They weren't the same airfields. They weren't the same squadrons. On December seventh, nineteen forty-four, the Japanese made a huge attack. They were going after troop ships and a bunch of other targets. And Bong and McGuire somehow magically came together. They weren't in the same squadron or same airfield or anything. And him and their wingmen flew together in a formation of four and protected the troop ships below. If you're a Japanese pilot that day, you probably wonder what the hell you did to deserve, you know, those four coming after you. I believe. Though only their wingmen scored the kills, I think three three kills for their two wingmen combined. Um, but he was a great pilot, Tom McGuire, and he did something really stupid, but it got him the Medal of Honor. But it did get him killed. Uh, one of his P-38s, if I remember the story correctly, is one of his P-38s went down in his squad, and he they want to protect the guy from the zero, so they kind of made this circle formation, low and slow around him, and I believe a zero dived either on McGuire, one of his wingman he tried to pull formation too slow too low and went straight up and then basically came straight down and died instantly when he hit the ground it says a lot when you die you're trying to protect somebody else you know even if it was stupid uh the last thing we we'll talk about which we perhaps have to talk about is operation vengeance well operation vengeance is uh when we killed admiral yamamoto from the japanese navy we, we basically the u.s basically murdered him uh, our code breakers broke uh code, I think it was in April of 43, that Yamamoto was going to be uh, out touring bases uh, in a Betty bomber. We found out about it. They uh, asked, the president actually asked the Navy to shoot him down and to kill him, but the Navy didn't have any airplanes that could do, that had the range that could do it. So the only airplane that it was in, in theater that had the range to actually shoot down this the Betty bombers were the P-38. So the P-38s went and did it. Uh, only four guys were assigned to actually shoot him down, but I think there was a total of like 20 P-38s involved. 16 P-38s, four were assigned to go for the kill. Yeah, it was a, it was a huge force. They were backup airplanes, and they the 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 four airplanes that went in all had escorts to and from, and everything else like that. Um, they had drop tanks, and that's what they did. They basically hunted Yamamoto down. They found his his flight. I think he had eight or six or eight zero escorts along with two buddy bombers and the bombers of course were the target now Yamamoto's airplane was shot down it landed in a on an island and um, I think the Japanese actually found Yamamoto still strapped to his seat uh, he had he had two bullet wounds I think one in the head and one in the chest or something like that they're they're both confirmed to be 50 caliber bullet wounds from a, from a U.S. airplane, so a P-38 got him. Uh, there's some controversy survive, uh, surrounding the shoot-down of Yamamoto's airplane. Um, 
the Army Air Force gave a half credit to a guy by the name of Rex Barber and the full credit to another guy and his name just totally slipped my mind. I don't know, but there's evidence now that actually Rex Barber is the guy that actually shot the airplane down and uh, was supposed to receive a full full, full credit. As far as I know, um, I know there was a court case involved trying to remove Rex Barber from even half the kill and the Secretary of the Air Force finally just left it be, gave the one guy the full kill and Rex Rex Barber the half kill. Pretty stupid to fight about that when you took out the basically mastermind yeah. of the Japanese Navy. Like, yeah, like, I mean, yeah, that was the guy that planned the attack on Pearl Harbor. It was the guy that it was the guy that masterminded the uh, the attack on the Battle of Midway, uh, the invasion of the Aleutian Islands. Remember, Yamamoto was U.S. trained. He went to some university here in the U.S. I want to say maybe it was even Stanford here in California. It's a very, very, very smart man, a very smart individual. Uh, it it really hurt the Japanese Navy when he was killed. Yeah, there was that power void was never filled by him leaving. And basically, I'm not going to talk much about late war Pacific P-38s because it's just stories. Like it's just you know P-38s killing this and that. There was no really massive fight I want to bring up besides the one that we mentioned with uh, Bong and McGuire. Um, just you know stories of this and that. Nothing that really stands out. And the, you know we talked about the Eastern Front. You know they did bomber escort. They did bombing missions. They did ground attack missions. The aircraft. The thing you need to take away from the P-38. It was such a versatile airplane. It was a heavy fighter. It, it, it acted as a single seat fighter. You know, it flew against 109s, it attacked bombers, it did interception on a, a hundred different things, recon, uh, et cetera. And, and it was an aircraft that was always wanted, you know, before 1943, they couldn't get enough of these things. Um, by 1946, this is kind of sad, every single P-38 was flown to Arizona to the Boneyard that was 7,500 of them, including 500 brand new ones that never did anything, and they were all sold for surplus for $1,250, or they were either scrapped. And that's true for a lot of war- you see a lot of pictures of U.S. warbirds that are you know P-40s and P-47s. All this happened quite around, but um, there's a lot of P-38s in 1945, 1946. Uh, we mentioned Tony Lavier early on, the, the Lockheed test pilot. He actually went down to Arizona. He bought one. He took it back to Cali and. It was a huge deal for the Lockheed guys because they actually had a P-38 that they could do anything they wanted to. And they kind of restored it and souped it up and modified it for air shows. And he went around, Tony Olvier went around the country demonstrating the uh, P-38 for a while. And I guess you can still see P-38s from time to time flying and in museums you see them quite a bit and so on. Um, is there anything you want to talk about, I guess, post-war, any final thoughts? No, it's the same with the it was- Got airplane. It didn't last very long. It was a, it was it was Lockheed's first really, 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 really complex airplane. Um, it wasn't until the J model came out that it was actually the airplane that both Lockheed and the Army had envisioned in the first place. It took way too long to develop. Um, it's just a footnote in history now. I mean, r- really, there are very few P, very few P-38s flying around anymore. It was an okay airplane. It was an okay airplane. For, for, yeah, it was an okay airplane. For what it did, it was good. I mean, for a twin engine fighter, it was head and shoulders above yeah. the others that were out there and, and what, what it faced. You know, you would have to compare it against the Whirlwind, which it was far better than Whirlwind. Even the Whirlwind had better yeah. firepower, um, speed, and maneuverability, and all that. Then, yep. then what you compare it to, it wouldn't be against the MB410 because that's a two seater. You know, BF110 you consider a two seater, and so on. So you know, single engine. Or sorry, a uh, single-seat, two-engine fighter. I don't really know what you could say was was in comparison to it and its capability. So I'm gonna leave it there. If you have any questions about late mod, I know we kind of skipped. There's so much information we can't cover everything. Yeah, it's just it's it's overload. It really is overload. Um, it's a very complex aircraft and it has a lot of history. Um, hopefully, you picked up a few new things. Like I said, the J and the L, we kind of smashed that together because very similar aircraft. You can barely tell a difference in a lot of ways. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Ask those questions for the Q&A podcast coming up. And also, if you have any F3F flying barrel footage, go ahead and send that in because we're going to do a podcast about that coming up. And thanks for watching.